Do not go gentle into that good night. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Though wise men at their end no dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight, and learn too late, they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death, who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to start by saying that I'm really very happy to be in this place and to be given a tour by Alan um, of the different rooms and, and having a conversation about Bill and Thomas. But I did want to ask you about the two cats that are, <laughs> that are behind your head there, if you want to start with that. What a great place to start a conversation about one of the world's greatest poets. Let's talk about the cats over my shoulder. Well, they're actually a specific reference. We are here in Dylan Thomas's birthplace. Uh, and this particular room uh, is the parlor. Uh, and Dylan and his sister Nancy would not have been allowed into this room. This was kept for best to show off for anybody who visited the family. It probably would have been under lock and key, but they were allowed in here at Christmas time. <laughs> so when Dylan writes Child's Christmas in Wales and talks about separating the useful presents from the useless presents, he'd have done that on the floor in this room. And also when he writes A Child's Christmas in Wales, there's a story there about the f a fire. And the boys outside realize that in the room where the fire is, there are some cats. And they rush in and try and rescue the cats <laughs> by trying to throw a snowball that's right, that's right. or two at the fire to put the fire out. <laughs> that's why we have the cats and the snowballs. But then the parents realize, hang on, that's not going to work. And they call the fire brigade. I'd wondered about that helmet there. Which well. is why that is there too. So there are references and are other things here on the, de on the desk there uh, to A Child's Christmas because Dylan would have enjoyed pretty much 20, 23 Christmases in this room. So that's why I'm being watched over by the cats. <laughs> well, I, I'm seeing so much authentic detail as I looked around here and I did notice the Welsh China dogs, which my own parents, when they emigrated, uh, brought with them from Wales. So um, my mantle at home growing up, I had China dogs and I inherited them. So they're, they're in my home as well. Yeah. But they would have been in, in Dylan's home, of course, because Welsh families yeah. had them. Yeah, absolutely. Dog, dogs with eyebrows, as they're sometimes called. <laughs> right. I wanted to learn a little more about um, Dylan's writing habits here, because of course he wrote his earliest poems very young. He was in this house. Could you explain a little bit about where he wrote and how that came about? Yeah, absolutely. D Dylan pretty much decided early in his teens that he wanted to be a poet. And by the time that he was 15, he started to write his serious poetry uh, in a collection of notebooks. It turned out to be a collection of notebooks. So between his age of 15 and about 19, he filled five notebooks with over 200 poems. Um, and he'd have written those predominantly in almost the smallest room of the house, which was uh, Dylan's bedroom. Uh, a very productive bedroom, uh, literary-wise, 
and probably the most, one of the most important literary bedrooms anywhere. Right. Uh, and to think that so much work came out of there. Of, of the poems he had published, over half uh, were written here. So it is by far the most important building in his story. Um, and and it, it's amazing. And, and those poems in the notebooks form the basis of what was in his first volume, his second volume, and his third volume. Yeah. So what you're really saying is that the guy who ended up going to London to create a stir in the literary world was showing them the poems of a teenager. So when he was uh, ready to publish his first volume, which I know came out from a London press, he was living here, wasn't he? Yes, he was living with mum and dad. Yeah, 20 uh, years old or and so. His, and his eight-year-old sister, uh, his sister eight years older than him. Yes, he was, he was still living here for the first two volumes, uh, 18 and 25 uh, poems. He was, he was living here. Uh, and it's remarkable, it, it's a, it was an up-and-coming area of Swansea at the time. Uh, this house itself was brand new. The Thomases were the first people ever to live here. Um, and they moved in in August 1914. And only a matter of weeks later, in October, Dylan is born in the bedroom above us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, so he's born in to a brand new house in an up-and-coming area of Swansea, very comfortable. Uh, the dad insisted on having two maids as well in the family. One came in on a Monday to wash all the clothes, the other Monday to Friday to cook and to clean. Right. Um, so that's the world that Dylan was brought, uh, born into. I can remember reading um, somewhere as Dylan is you know, trying to get published and making connections among some of the important writers and editors. Of course, he was in contact with T.S. Eliot. And um, I read something in maybe some letters that he was not comfortable with T.S. Eliot. And I think the cultural difference, maybe the age difference, the class difference, and what you're saying about the kind of almost class pretensions of the family, Dylan didn't seem to have that and bred in himself. He seemed to me to be uncomfortable around people who had authority or power um, over, maybe presumed over him. And my understanding is his lunch with T.S. Eliot didn't go that well. And he said someplace that Eliot mostly talked about his rheumatism. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, but I, the other thing I wanted just to throw into the discussion of his launching his career is that um, T.S. Eliot, when he was himself very young, published the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock in Poetry Magazine, and I think it was, I think it was 1915, and it made a huge impact in the poetry world at the time. So Ezra Pound sent it to Harriet Monroe, who was editor. She published it, and Eliot might have been himself in the early 20s. Changed you know, everything. And then Dylan Thomas, he's 20, he publishes 18 poems in 1934, and it's very similar, I think. It's parallel. Yeah. It changes everything. Ah, and, and people are appalled by it, or they think it's fantastic, and they write reviews that are laudatory, or they're writing these kind of, you know, hatchet jobs on mm. Dylan Thomas. I'm fascinated by that, because I've, I've, all, I've all wanted to know more about the Elliot Link, and, and you've just, you've just done that. Well, it, I think they have that. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's an interesting relationship because by the time Dylan hit the scene, uh, modernism as such under Eliot would have been 10 years old plus. So it, it wasn't as new. But then Dylan came in and what int intrigues me about the impact Dylan had was 18 poems, that very first volume of 36 pages yeah. with a plain white cover with just 18 poems on it and Dylan Thomas with no biog of the author, no photograph of the author, no words of um, r review or recommendation from other poets. Yeah. It was completely anonymous. And mm. it just lands in mm -hmm. to the literary world. And they didn't know then that the guy responsible for that was a guy from small town West Wales. Right, that's right. Um, I've always been kind of intrigued at the titles he gives. He calls so many poems poem, and his first two books, poems, as if there's in a, in a way no pretension to it, but also it draws attention, as you say, not to him, but to the poems, to the poems in the books that are the important things. 
Yeah, because that anonymity was on his uh, insistence. He didn't want mm -hmm. photo on a, you know, Dylan Thomas is a young promising poet from, he didn't want any of that. Yeah, well, yeah, so in the States, um, what was happening at that time that Dylan Thomas was publishing his first books is that the major literary magazines had maybe a correspondent who might be looking at British poetry at the time uh -huh. and then writing a column about it. So they'd be trying to notice what was going on in Britain that was worthy of comment and then Poetry Chicago would have an article or the Partisan Review would have an article about it. So that's how Dylan Thomas was getting introduced by London critics yeah. to an American audience. I was just going to say, so it was London-led. So Dylan's introduction critically to the States was London-led. Yes, and it had to be because there were no books here anybody could pick up in a bookstore and review. So London-led, which meant that the, the, the attacks, which were very frequent, yes. or there's an English critic named Derek Savage who wrote this very laudatory review, you'd get those as well. But his reputation was, um, uh, you know, all, some of the stereotypes were currently being formed about obscure, you know, uh, writing about love and death and not much else, not very rational. And it took a while for those stereotypes to be analyzed and maybe, maybe changed. And we had talked about this earlier. There's a critic, John Goodby, who's done a lot of work in trying to show uh, the relevance of Dylan, Dylan Thomas. Yeah, but a lot of that obscurity does refer back to what we discussed earlier, that you're talking about the poems written by a teenager. Yeah. And, and therefore, a lot of the themes are going to be what teenagers were obsessed with, which is sex and death. Yes, uh, right. And, and, and also, um, as he's learning his craft, being obscure just for the sake of being obscure sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and um, critics would see that as being a new voice and a new style, which it was, and that's what began to get his reputation. And so, again, thinking about the States, um, one publisher, James Laughlin, was very interested in what was going on in Britain, and he wrote somewhere that Edith Sitwell had mentioned this new young poet, and I think she didn't like Thomas at first, at and then the first, no. came around to yeah, him. Yeah. So she may have put him onto it. And then he wrote to Thomas in 1938 saying, could I publish you exclusively in the States? So you're saying it was all London critics originally making judgments about Thomas in the States. Now he gets published there and suddenly American writers can begin to make their own judgments about Dylan Thomas and that's, they, a, that's an important shift yes it's a crucial shift and it, what it meant was writers like um, over time Theodore Rutke, John Berriman, later Sylvia Plath, Allen Ginsberg, The Beats and Kenneth Rexroth all made their own judgments and decided this is really important work and it needs to be published and written about in the States that's interesting. What there's so many layers there. <laughs> what what difference would the appreciation of Dylan um, uh, uh, from by an American critic have made as opposed to what you were being fed yeah. by the London critic? I mean, how did they see? What was is was there a difference in interpretation of the man and his work? Uh, that is a a really complicated question. Yeah. And I'm, I wonder, I'm just speculating here, if Dylan's Welshness was a factor in it. Because I had the impression in reading through a number of reviews in England that there was a little bit of a resistance, maybe, or a kind of a, you know, he's not one of us, which I think he felt as well. Never felt really a part of the London poetry circle. That American critics would not understand or have... Yeah have brought to bear to the question. To them, he was Welsh. A few people thought he was English, but most people understood he was Welsh. And it, it wasn't um, something that they resisted at all. In fact, I would say more embraced. That's fascinating. Yeah. And that is a big shift. Yes. Um, because he was on the outside because he was from 
miles and miles away from London, especially in those days. He's from Swansea. Yes. Uh, so he was literally on the outside. Uh, but what, was there an element that he wanted to be on the outside as well? You know, I, I read not too long ago uh, a critical article in which, I can't remember who wrote it, um, a Welsh critic said that Thomas worked to put himself beyond use to any authority figure in poetry <laughs> because he could be offensive, he could be, you know, he could be drunk, he could just be um, in, uncommunicative or not show up for events. So yeah, I think he worked to keep himself in a margin outside of that mainstream. I think you're right about that. He behaved in that way in yeah. order to make sure that he was kept out. Beyond use to, to the people, to authority figures that he was uncomfortable with. This might have been what um, appealed to that figure, Kenneth, Kenneth Rexroth, that um, I mentioned earlier, who picked up on Thomas through James Lachlan. So Lachlan would publish his books, The Map of Love, and uh, Thomas's stories and poems in the States, and Rexroth would get them because he was a friend of Lachlan's and he published with New Directions. He'd read them. And when he was authorized to edit an anthology of British poets, so you've got an American audience who know very little about British poets except for Auden and his circle. Mm -hmm. And so Rexroth says, okay, we're going to do the New British Poets, published by New Directions Press, and the centerpiece is going to be Dylan Thomas. This is 1948. It's out in 1949. And this, I think, really gets Thomas's reputation out more in the States. And um, Rexroth himself championed poets from the margins. So you're talking about Dylan being outside of the, of the center of literary authority in London as a Welsh poet. Rexroth thought, it's Dylan Thomas and his circle in Wales, Cadric Rees, the magazine Wales, Gwyn um, Jones and the Welsh Review. In Scotland, it's Hugh McDermott. And um, in Ireland, of course, it's Yeats. Not England. He's not interested so much. He had English poets in there, of course. Yeah. But this anthology really emphasized the kind of all the constituent nations of Britain, not just England. So in that way, it was, it was kind of revolutionary. That's fascinating. He could see it from the outside, looking in. And he says, well, this is what I see. I see four nations. Yes, right. And he actually thought the best of the four were the Welsh. Oh, wow. So he not just not only published Dylan Thomas, but uh, Nigel Heseltine, Brenda Chamberlain, Kydrick Rees, Glyn Jones, and all the important poets writing at that time and, and gave them a platform. And I think that led up to Dylan's tours in 1950, because it came out in 49. Yeah. It's kind of paved the way yeah. for the big, the big change in, in the tours and all of that. What, where that gets interesting, this whole perception of the four nations, is if we stop and consider the attitude of the Welsh themselves to Dylan. Yes. Now, we mentioned yes. the London attitude, right. which we can label as the English attitude. Right. We mentioned the American way of seeing the different picture, but the Welsh looked at Dylan in another way again. Yes, yeah. Which, um, and then that splits into those who spoke Welsh and those who didn't. Yes. Uh, and there was a great deal of antipathy from the Welsh-speaking cultural literary world towards Dylan for decades and decades yeah. until relatively recently, yeah. because they saw him very much as an English poet. I remember there's that, that famous um, remark by Saunders Lewis that, um, did he say he's one of them? I can't remember no, exactly. He, um, it, it was a he discussion about an Anglo-Welsh, and Saunders Lewis said there's nothing hyphenated about him. That's right, that's right. Yes. So it's, he's not Anglo-Welsh, he's English. Yeah. Interesting, because Saunders Lewis, one of Europe's leading playwrights at, at one point in the last century, he lived just down the road here uh, while he lectured at Swansea <laughs> University. So it's not inconceivable that the little boy Dylan at about nine, ten years old 
would have been in the same shop as Saunders Lewis in the uplands down there. That's an aside, but <laughs> it's one of those lovely synchronicities yes. that uh, yes. that happened. But but uh, whether it, it's alleged that Saunders might have retracted those words later on, but whether he did or not, it's certainly true that the attitude was there. Yes. Um, I, I know we've just had a Welsh language plaque unveiled uh, out in the front of the house. Uh, and the, the, the force behind that was the former Archdruid T. James Jones, mm. Jim Parknest. Mm -hmm. And he translated Under Milkwood into Welsh in right. the late 1960s. And he had a really difficult time for doing that, with people being very critical of him and saying, why are you wasting your time yes. with such a man? <clears throat> Uh, but Jim has persevered and has championed Dylan's Welshness and his Welsh heritage and his Welsh influence on him. Um, but uh, he, he, he's not easily regarded as a Welsh poet by many in Wales. Yeah. Well, I think his own remarks about <laughs> Wales have sort of poisoned the waters to an extent. But, you know, you, you mentioned things have shifted. And um, I don't know if you heard that um, radio talk to Morris gave on Dylan Thomas. It's in this BBC archive, and he's a Welsh language poet yeah. who has, uh, I wouldn't, not just come to terms, but embraced um, Dylan and other poets you included when he was alive the same. So, yeah, it has shifted it from, has the, from the real antipathy you describe, yeah. which was there. Yeah, yeah. But well, what, I mean, the fact we have a plaque on the Welsh on the wall now is, is an indication because it, we, we raised funds and asked people to donate and we got more than enough money to, to put the, the, the plaque on the wall because the great. Welsh community wanted to support it. It, it has been a big change. What, uh, what do you think about the attitude of the, of the English language Welsh poets to him as opposed to the... Welsh language poets. Yeah, uh, he's he's very much um, again. This might be a, a, a British reference. I'm not sure. A, a Marmite mm -hmm. um, po po poet. Um, you either like like him or you don't. Uh, I mean, I, I do a lot of schools work through uh, through the birthplace. Yeah, I do workshops for for, for school young people, um, and and it's it's fair to say that it's not always easy to get heads of English to show any interest in Dylan. Yeah. Uh, you can't assume that just you teach English, you're in Wales, therefore you like Dylan. That, that's not true uh, at all. And there's a lot of people who wouldn't even bother yeah. still. Yeah. But I, I'm not sure that's a majority, to be honest. Uh, I think there's a growing appreciation. The more time goes on, the more maybe we move away from the myths that were created to popularize him, which do help, and if they keep his name going, mm -hmm. keep the myths going, that's fine. But let's add a few true stories in as well mm -hmm. uh, about the fact that he was such a disciplined poet, uh, that he worked really hard, that he crafted, he wasn't the wasteful, uh, superficial, light-hearted kind of guy that's that right. people want to portray. He was very disciplined and a hard worker who would take three weeks working on one line, yeah. uh, yes. for example. So when those stories start coming up more and we, the people realise that uh, the, the early poems were the poems of a teenager, that makes people sit up and think, oh, right, OK. <clears throat> this guy was 15 to 19 and he gets enough poems there to publish two or three volumes. Uh, when they come through, the appreciation is increasing and that's happening because time is allowing that. Yes, and I think some publications like when the letters to Vernon Watkins came out, you could see the discipline you're talking about yeah. and the kind of like the craft technique that he painstakingly uh, did to make these poems what they were and they were published. Um, and you know, at the time in the States, nobody really knew that. So the cliches you're talking about could take hold. And as we, we talked about actually in the ride up to Swansea, um, he was a brilliant performer. And yeah. we listened to him read an Auden poem that was just, you know, it gives you chills because he could perform so, yeah. so expertly. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. The, 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 his public profile in the States was probably higher than it was over here in terms of the general public. I mean, he went on four tours as a rock and roll star um, before rock and roll started. Uh, and he was, he was, well, he was in a party in Charlie Chaplin's house. <laughs> I mean, that really does some, uh, he's a poet yeah. in that Charlie Chaplin's house. A guy who lived in this house for 20 years of his life yeah. in small West Wales, Swansea. 
compared on a global scale. And there he is with Marilyn Monroe and Shelley Winters. <laughs> that shows the level of adulation and that people wanted this poet. Now, he didn't have that over here. It's fascinating how that happened. I don't fully understand it. I have this <laughs> sense of different forces all coming together. Yeah, Part of it was, you know, the preparation that Lachlan did in getting his name out and the reviews. And this um, organizer, John Malcolm Brennan, was, for whatever his faults might be, brilliant at getting word out. And somehow, you know, I think I read somewhere he had a thousand people in the... New York, why, when he read there yeah. and his first tour, it's astonishing how that could happen. Yeah. It, like spoken word back in the early 1950s, and he was so good at it, word must have just traveled. So every campus then wanted this person to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also, I, I don't know the extent to which this is true, but I think the country was ready for a, a subversive new voice in poetry post-World War II America, yeah. the Eisenhower years, which was so conservative, leading up to the San Francisco Renaissance and the, um, and the beat poets and the civil rights movement, and that he was just at the beginnings of that and people were ready to hear it. Yeah, that yeah. may be a factor in this adulation that you're describing. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, it, that's interesting, the post-World War, because Dylan had published three volumes, 18 Poems, 25, and Map of Love, but it's the 1946 one, the one that's their deaths and entrances. That was the real big bestseller for him. Mm, and that was a, mm, less mm. than a year after the Second World War finished. Yeah. And they printed 3,000 copies of that compared to 500, uh, 500 of the first. Yeah. So that, that, and that, that deals with the issues that were prevalent at the, when a world war comes to an end. Right. Uh, and no surprise, that is a bestseller. So that starts a process that makes him more pop publicly popular here as opposed to uh, with literary critics. Uh, but also the same happens over in the States. Yes, yeah, he, his, his reputation just exploded in the States. And um, you know, the, the, the same didn't happen then in Britain. I'm not as aware of what was going on in Britain in the 50s when he was publishing, but he wasn't able to give readings of the sort that he could give. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, if, if you talk, he did way over 150 talks and, and, and readings in, in, on his American tours, um, which drove him into the ground, literally, uh, yeah. at, at his last tour because he was unwell going out. But right. John Malcolm Brennan didn't want to let up at all on the schedule that he prepared for him because he'd lose face and, and money. Yes, uh, so, yes. So he just kept Dylan going and it was too much and he collapsed and um, but yeah yeah it, it's no he didn't have that same level uh, here so that's where a lot of the public profile comes back here so the literary criticism goes from here first over the pond mm -hmm. and then the whole public image and, and, and adulation etc comes back across the pond to here yes yeah, in the, in the States, his reputation just took off in the 50s and 60s. And, you know, the story that uh, Sylvia Plath memorized in most of his poems with Ted Hughes and could recite them at, at will, and Seamus Heaney from Ireland also. And then I think it took a, it took a slump again as um, his alleged, well, and perhaps real obscurity was being uh, attacked. And he was really off syllabi in colleges and universities for a number of years. But I think there is a renewed interest in him and it comes back to the publication of his collected poems and you know uh, the work of a number of scholars looking and showing his relevance. Again, there's an article on Dylan Thomas as a green poet, for example, published not too long ago. So the tide might be coming back for his work. Yeah, and yeah. my students still uh, relate well to his poetry, though he's a tough poet to imitate. Yes. If you're going to be a creative writer, he's not a good person to have <laughs> no, on no. your radar. And I think some, some Welsh poets may have suffered from that. Yes, um, yes. The yes. shadow of Dylan Thomas. Because, well, well, there's, there's many reasons, but, but one reason for that is that Dylan um, likes the, the sound of words. And people keep on looking for meaning, when sometimes there isn't 
of necessity any meaning. Um, Make a willow cabin at your gates and call upon my soul within the house. Write loyal cantons of contemnate love and sing them loud even in the dead of night. Who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them? Who keeps faith forever? There is the sea, great and broad, in which are swarms without number, animals, both great and small. We're, we're in the parlour here, and <laughs> the, the, Dylan's father's study is in the room next door. And after Dylan died, uh, his mum, Flory, uh, gave an interview in which she recalled her husband reading Shakespeare to Dylan in the study in there when Dylan was four years old. <laughs> Now, that for me is significant because no way that a four-year-old Dylan understood the Hamlet that was being read to him or the Dickens stories or the Bible stories. But over his primary years, he would have been hearing the sounds and the rhythms and the patterns of all yeah. these classics. And so he, would, he grew up hearing words without understanding their meaning. Yeah. And I think that's why he, a lot of his poetry, when he starts at 15 in those notebooks, they're about soundscape as much as about what does that mean. And that's part of the reason why people didn't take to him originally. I, I presume that they were looking for meaning when maybe there wasn't any. Yes. And I think I understood that his father was an expert reader as well, that in classes when he was teaching English literature, students would love simply the performance of it, which Dolan must have picked up on. Absolutely. And there were a lot of influences on Dolan's performance. That's certainly one, because he would have heard his own father reading to him. Yeah. So it was a natural step for him to read his work. Mm -hmm. And also his sister was uh, an aspiring actress, not allowed to be an actress by, a, by her father who wouldn't want his daughter on the stage. Yeah. But she did act locally. And she took Dolan along to the Swansea Little Theatre at one point and Dylan ended up really liking it and took part in about 10 different productions of the Swansea Little Theatre. So he had that stage uh, presence uh, as, as well from, from that. And he would be taken on Sundays occasionally to his uncle's chapel, mm. uh, the other side of Swansea, right. where you would have what the Welsh call hoyl, which was the, the, the fervour and, and the spirit that the, the, the preachers would get into to the point that they would almost be singing their sermons. Now, Dylan would have seen a lot of that. So they all played in to this whole sounds, soundscape. Dylan, the performance poet, and he certainly changed performance poetry. Yes. Uh, that's one impact he really did have. Uh, the whole idea of performance poetry took off after Dylan came to the, surf, to the scene. You know, that's maybe a good segue into uh, talking about Under Milkwood because of his theater background, his performance background, and then um, producing this incredible play for Voices, uh, which I saw recently in Cardiff. So it was semi-fresh in my mind. All right, yeah. Um, but um, I'm not quite sure of the circumstances of his writing it. I don't know if you can add to that where he was. And well, the, the one thing that's lovely about Under Milkwood is that there are so many towns or villages or communities in Wales that claim it's based <laughs> right. there. Yeah. And I think that's great because people feel the need to have a sense of ownership of such a work. Uh, what the actual reality is, is, is obviously not one answer. Um, there are references... Uh, Dylan had a really good friend while he lived here, a man who kept a shop, a grocer's shop, in the village down there, Bert Trick. Mm -hmm. Now, Bert was a leading socialist who would influence Dylan in his political views. Uh, but also there's a, there, there's a letter as well um, between Dylan and Bert Trick when Bert mentions the fact that he'd had discussions with Dylan about an idea he was working on, uh, about on 24 hours in the life of one village. Now, this was in the early 1930s, 20 years yeah. before Under Milkwood came out. So the idea for such a concept was hatched here in this house. Um, uh, the world went mad, I think it was called, or mm, something, right. something similar again. Uh, but that didn't actually develop 
to be under Milkwood, as we know, no one love it, mm-hmm. uh, until he moved to Larn and, and he finished it there. But he'd also lived in New Quay before right. that. And quite early one morning, which is also there, that, that's, that's a, that there are influences from New Quay and Lan and Fishguard and Swansea. <laughs> so for me, that's why it works. They can all claim him. And I think it's great they all try to. <laughs> you know, when I saw it performed again and I realized, and I've seen it performed a few times, I've never taught it, but it struck me as an American or Welsh American as a very Welsh play. And I didn't teach it because it would require explaining so much. And I find it hysterically funny. And I I hate to explain jokes to students because that really kills the joke. So um, so again, so for me, it's a very Welsh play, but I was interested uh, in, you know, something about the translation of that play into Welsh and the response by Welsh speaking Welsh people yeah. to this Welsh play. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, well, for, for, to, to, to talk about the actual, uh, the original version first, yeah. uh, to pick up on your comment about the Welshness of it, I mean, when I do any workshops or talks or, or when I show people around this house, um, I, I invariably use the phrase, when I'm reading under Milkwood, I'm reading Welsh, but it happens to be in English. <laughs> <laughs> because it is so in terms of rhythm and pattern and color yes. and, 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 and it is so Welsh and this, the sing-song way that the people speak to each other mm-hmm. and, and the, the references they make and the, the small chit-chat, yep. which I'm sure Dylan would have taken a great deal of from Cum Donkin Park, actually, over, right. or just across the road there, which is a big central part of his life. But in addition to that then, so when it became to the point that Jim Jones uh, wanted to translate under Milkwood, it was almost a natural thing to happen, uh, and that it is no surprise to me that that translation is has been heralded as being almost as good as the original. Oh, I didn't know that. Because yeah. it is so such a small step in one way, but obviously the, Jim's skill in in translating it is is phenomenal. He's had to come up with proper Welsh phrases for some of the odd English <laughs> phrase, Welsh phrases that Dylan uses, but it, it is it is. A fantastic read in Welsh as well, um, but unfortunately, uh, when Jim was translating that, he was a, a minister of a chapel in um, in West Wales, uh, and he was given a really difficult time for two reasons. Firstly, for bothering to translate Dylan anyway, that the, he, the Welsh didn't think that he was a poet that was or a, a, a playwright, whatever you <laughs> however you describe the author of Under Milkwood, that 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 Dylan um, didn't deserve such attention anyway, why right. bother? Right. And then of course, as a chapel minister, having seen to dabble with the work of a heathen, uh, a drunken heathen <laughs> at that, uh, it, was, it was a double whammy for him, unfortunately. And, 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 and he has had a really hard time. I know in my own experience, uh, not quite the same level as Jim, but uh, I, I can identify with that. I suggested a documentary uh, program on Dylan to the Welsh language uh, broadcasting channel um, and the commissioner uh, responsible's reply to me was why should we waste our money on a man like him <laughs> and that would have been That's 15 years ago 15 not in the 60s ago, so when uh, yeah and it's still with us it's still yeah. there but thankfully it's changing because we have a, a Welsh language plaque on the wall right. unveiled this year which is a more than just a sign on the wall it's a sign of more than that, mm-hmm. uh, that the attitude is shifting. Yeah. Uh, and Dylan is far more accepted. His Welsh heritage is being enjoyed and celebrated mm-hmm. and being made, made, given more credibility than it, than it has been uh, until now. So I, I have to end on that positive note yes. because that's where we're at now. Good. But it has been a long road to get there. And I'll, I'll say just one more thing about the story of the response to the translation. It is impressive that people, chapel goers, care enough about a play, <laughs> work of literature, to make this big fuss. It matters. You yeah. know, it's important to the culture. And yeah. that, that's itself, I think, noteworthy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because D- Dylan's Welsh heritage is there. I mean, I, I, I referenced the plaque uh, before. Uh, for the first time, it, I'm not sure exactly how often, but when the Thomases moved in to this house in 1914, 
Dylan's father chose the name Glan Reed for the uh, for the new house that they just moved into, and that is the name of a farm uh, run by uh, his his uncle, who was um, a, a minister, but also who was a leading poet and scholar, Gwilym Marles. Mm -hmm. Now the dad chose the name of a Welsh yeah. language prominent public person and poet I chose the name of his farm for this house and I think that is hugely significant and then on top of that he chose the name Gwilym Marles the name Marles as the middle name for both his children mm -hmm. for Nancy and for Dylan so in that naming process there's a strong identif identification on DJ Thomas's part with Dylan's Welsh yeah. heritage he could have chosen a pretentious English name in this new up-and-coming area of Swansea that was established as a middle-class suburb, suburbia, mm -hmm. but he didn't. He chose a Welsh name and two middle names, as well as choosing Dylan. Yes. Or whoever you pronounce it is open to <laughs> debate, but I've always said Dylan all my life. But <laughs> as well as choosing Dylan, because that name in itself would have been completely unheard of in those days. There's right. nobody else. And would have had that day. Coming from a branch of the Mabinagi, at that time nobody would have really picked up on what that obscure little Absolutely. character was. The story it, allegedly is is that the, the DJ read a review of a play that uh, was based in London that was based that had a Mabinagi connection, and that it included that name. Yeah, uh, and he took it from there. But uh, it, was, it was a completely obscure thing to do. So th I think those three naming processes say a lot about DJ's awareness of heritage and how he would have portrayed that to, to his son. Yeah, I, I think for the question of his Welshness, you're going to respond differently if you're Welsh as you are, uh, American or English people looking at the work. When I read something like uh, the play for voices or some of the stories that seem thoroughly grounded in Welshness. Some of the great poems, uh, Do Not Go Gentle, don't have a, a grounding in place and time, but other poems absolutely could only, it seems to me, be written out of Wales or have a grounding in Wales. Yeah. Uh, Fern Hill, of course, being an obvious example, yeah. but many, many poems. So, um, and yeah, it's significant that he, he, he hardly wrote anything at all other than in Wales. Right, that's right. I mean, he didn't write hardly anything anywhere else. Very interested to hear how you first came yeah. upon his work and what impact it had. Yeah, so I first came upon his work actually really recently, which is, I, I know it's kind of, uh, I don't know, yeah, but uh, I, I came upon it when I came here. So it's, it's like a really weird, uh, so when I, um, before I came here, I had seen, uh, there was this movie about Dylan Thomas. And so I knew about his poetry from that movie. And I had kind of read stuff, but it wasn't anything like that stuck that, like it wasn't that intense, um, but I loved the movie. And so because when I came to Swansea University for my grandpa and other reasons, I was also like, oh, this is where Dylan Thomas is from. And then that's when I kind of got more involved with it. And then I was like, I want to learn more. So I went to the Dylan Thomas Center, the museum, mm -hmm. which is really cool because it like goes through his entire life. and. It inspired me as a writer because, I mean, the way that he would, he would write out words and then just like keep them and save them and then just have them. And I, I think that's so cool. Um, and then later I decided I need to go to the birthplace and then I just asked if I could volunteer. So I actually learned a lot more now being here because I don't feel like there's a lot People don't really talk about Dylan Thomas that much in, in the U.S., at least where I'm from, like, because on the west side, I don't know how it is on the east. No, I think that's, that's true. It doesn't yeah. surprise me that 
you wouldn't have had any exposure because I, I didn't either when I was just going through high school and even in yeah. college it, until I took a modern poetry course which yeah. was my first introduction and it was just on the syllabus and nothing big deal yeah. was made of it but I liked the poetry yeah. and I liked also the fact that that he's Welsh, so that connected yeah. to me too. I think I know the film you're talking about. Yes, yeah, was it one that was about his last days, or do you remember? It was a uh, Keira Knightley, wasn't it? Oh, I haven't seen that one. Yeah, no, that's one I haven't seen. The Edge okay. of Love. Yeah, but it's coming at it through other means than yes. getting exposed to the poetry makes complete sense yeah. because he's kind of disappeared for a while. I know it, it frustrates me because I'm just like you were like in high school and in in uh, in like for my bachelor's I didn't really like. There was n not really that much emphasis on Dylan Thomas at all. Like, I mean, there's Bob Dylan, so I mean, and, and I guess he got his part of his name from Dylan Thomas. But I mean, other than that, no one, no, and it's, I think it's a shame because like listening or like reading his stuff, like listening to it on YouTube, like from, you know, him narrating that you can, like, I want to be that kind of poet, like that actually just puts everything into mm, your work. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of poets do that, but I, I just feel like it's so, it hits harder when the poet reads his own work, his or her own work, but also like is really good at reading his yes, own, like because yes, you can feel yeah. that impact. Yeah, in fact I was yeah. wanted to ask if you mm -hmm. think there's any change he might have, his work might have made on mm -hmm. you or it impacted your own writing after you of course discovered him and yeah. then been reading him and then been at the center, yeah. or is it sort of separate? You know, you like his work mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. change what you do? Oh, uh, so I think it was a mixture of things, because I did a poetry module for my master's, um, and with that, I did learn a bit more about Dylan Thomas, but that was, it was a combi uh, the combined aspect of both of those that really uh, changed my poetry, and it just made it, because I'm already like more, like I like that emotion, that intensity, but his made me, I don't want, clever is like, Makes it sound like it wasn't clever before, but it's like that. You you use words. It, you, you how many like there are so many words in the English language. There are, you know you can find one word to mean like a ton of different things, and I, I like that he does that. And mm -hmm. I will just like mm -hmm. say it. so that that definitely inspired me. You know I had this experience of sort of liking the famous poems that I was taught as a student, but not being like yeah. overwhelmed and coming back to it. And then I was. At the National Library in Aberystwyth, yeah. doing some research on something else, and I came across a letter by Dylan Thomas. And I read this letter, you know, written in his little scrawl, and it was incredibly funny. It was like the letter was yeah. brilliant, funny, witty, you know, um, playful, and at the end, begging for money, which he always did because he never had any money. And I thought this guy is a really good writer. Yeah. And I read more letters, and then I started in on the stories, which are fantastic, and under Milkwood. Yeah. And then I got back to the poetry. So my, my route kind of took a detour through yeah. his really funny prose. But, um, but I, I was saying earlier today, I think he's a hard poet to use as a model or to imitate because he's like, there's nothing else like him. So I don't know if you find in your poetry, stylistically, he is someone you know you would want to write like or or not yeah for my poetry i tend to do a lot of uh, prose poetry i know there's oh, a big oh. debate about like if that's like a real you know like if it's like flash fiction more or right. poetry but i really like it because uh my background is in novels oh. and so that kind of brings that in um so i don't think my like the the way i format my poems or the way like um, he creates his poems my, like I, I won't do that same thing, but I just like his word usage, and I like the uh, the images that he puts in. Yeah, so. um, pretty much the same way with my yeah. students too. Some of them will instantly love him for the reasons you're describing, and these are often students that just like the music of a poem. Yeah. And then those students will be very frustrated that they can't get transparent meaning from it, and um, I, I think that's okay because it's taste. Yeah. Um, but but I teach him whenever I can now. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. See, we need more people like you because I feel like we <laughs> we always do the same authors and poets, and, and I'm not saying that they're bad, but I just feel like that's one of the reasons why maybe kids don't like reading as much is that there's not a lot of 
I mean, it's always the same stuff. There's not a huge emphasis on anything. It's just like you have to read these things. Sorry, but it's like you should make an emphasis and yes. enjoy it, you know? I, I agree. I mean, is the fact that he's um, Welsh yeah. important to you? I do like that because I, yeah. I have Welsh roots as well. Yeah. And, uh, and so they just, it, there it is, it's nice. It but. does, because when you look into his life, then maybe you understand a little more about your, your own background yeah. and going back. It's a, similar mm -hmm. to me. My mother's from a little village in South Wales, as I was yeah. saying earlier, not that far from Swansea. Yeah. So the world that he des Thomas describes does reflect on her world. They're of the same generation, roughly. Mm. So, um, yeah, that, it helps me connect to the poems. Yeah. And you also saying the fact that he's a really good reader was a good reader. That's so That's important. important. Yeah. So okay, so I do. Uh, I go to a lot of writing groups, mm -hmm. and there are some writers who I'll meet where they think that they don't have time to read, or it's reading is not as important as writing, yeah. and they're just like. For one, we need to help each other in the community. Otherwise, like no one's going to buy anyone's book. But also, like, <laughs> how are you supposed to grow and be better if you if you don't know what your competition, you know, is doing or your yeah. heroes are doing? Yeah, yeah. I, reading is so important. I love it. But yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, well, I think there has been a change, at least. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking about the East Coast with more people going to his work than had yeah. been before. I think I was describing earlier, it's like he was so popular when he did yeah. those reading tours and you know, he's such a fantastic performer. And then it kind of went away and coming back because people like you get interested in his work and find it valuable. Yeah. It's just weird how if things change and move the way they do. Like what, I mean, yeah, I guess like what what inspired uh, this like fa like this almost fad to come back to Dylan Thomas because I don't there isn't like there hasn't been a huge emphasis in the U S to you know bring in his poetry yet like it does feel like people are bringing it in yeah so I, I don't know I'm not sure myself except yeah. there was a centenary as I think it's pronounced over here of something that produced a lot of celebrations of him yeah. and then I think people came back and said that's right. It's really, really good. And certain books that have come out recently, that new mm -hmm. edition of his poems and a book of criticism by John Goodby on the work itself, that's just kind of, okay, you forgot about this guy. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, he's really good. Yeah. So, but, but there's maybe more to it than that. I don't know what makes reputations. It's weird. No, yeah. yeah. Luck, you know, yeah. maybe. I mean, that's with everything, right? Yeah. You, you have to be lucky to make it. I think so. I first discovered the work of Dylan Thomas in 1953, and he has been my favorite poet ever since. My favorite poem by Dylan is A Refusal to Mourn the Death by Fire of a Child in London. A tremendous amount of work has gone into the restoration of number five. Visitors can now experience something of what life might have been for Dylan Thomas and his family in the 23 years that he lived in this house. Number five played an important part in shaping Dylan's life and work. I believe people's formative years impact on their behavior and development in later life. Dylan's writing shows the importance of family and friends and illustrates his warmth, humanity, and his social conscience. Dylan's memories of growing up in number five are mentioned everywhere in his works. For instance, he recalled that as a small child during the First World War, he heard people talk about a country called The Front, on which only young men went and few returned. The only front he knew was the little porch to the side of his house. He tells us that he couldn't understand it as a toddler, and as an adult felt that it referred to the pointlessness of war. I hope that you will take time to explore this house and its surroundings. Perhaps it will inspire you to learn more about Dylan Thomas. He might become your own favorite poet and writer. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. Um, that uh, Dylan was born in this room. Duh, this is where 
the mod. He wasn't the man was born. I was going to say he wasn't born a man, of course. But this, this is where Dylan was born. A matter of weeks only after the uh, family moved into this house because um, Flory obviously was pregnant when when they moved in. And it's it's, mm. it's hard to think, isn't it? That little boy whose photo on the on the mantelpiece over there, born in this room, the effect he would have on the literary world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, now that the uh, photograph above that, is that the family? Is that still yes, in the that's, center? Yes, and... that, that's, the, that's the family uh, taken in Carmarthen mm -hmm. outside uh, his dad's family home. And that's, uh, and Dylan is the, the blonde and the, the curly hair in the front. Yeah. Yeah, he's very aware of his, of his family links and he'd go and stay with his family, that side and his mother's side. Um, Every summer, yeah. you know, the holidays back in Carmarthenshire. So was that the uh, place where Fern Hill is located? Or the, That's the, the area. That's Johnstown, yeah. which is you know it's all around the same kind of Larne, Johnstown, uh, and San Stefan, and, and different mm -hmm. just around mm -hmm. that, that whole area. Um, so it would have been a totally different world to the world that he would have uh, known here. Yeah, uh, as a town, but an industrial town with docks. Uh, with a lot of pollution um, and with a completely different pattern of life mm -hmm. uh, to the rural agricultural one that he would enjoy uh, when he'd go on his family holidays. This is uh, his sister's bedroom. She was eight years older than Dylan, Nancy. And let me explain the twin beds first. Yes. <laughs> She didn't have a choice to sleep in either one. Uh, we have people are allowed to, to, can stay, uh, pay to stay in this house overnight, uh, and therefore to increase the occupancy uh, permutations, we have uh, mm. twin beds. <laughs> That's why they're here. But yeah, Nancy was uh, an aspiring actress, uh, and there are things here from the Swansea Little Theatre, some, oh. pro some props, and this is the man that was behind uh, the Swansea Little Theatre. Uh, and this here is a really one of the famous Welsh actresses in throughout Britain at the time, Sarah Siddons, uh, who uh, Nancy was a big fan of. And Nancy wanted to be an actress, but don't put my daughter on the stage, <laughs> was uh, DJ's attitude. So she didn't get to have her wish. And there is a little writing desk here. I think you had mentioned it was used by our poet on occasion. Is that right? Yes. As the cheeky younger brother, he would sneak into his uh, sister's room to write on a desk in the corner here. Uh, much to the annoyance of his sister, because when she then returned, when he'd left, there would be papers strewn all over the floor <laughs> uh, that Dylan hadn't tidied up after him. Typical well, it is brother. a bigger room, so I could see why he would want this space as his room, as we'll see, is not quite as nice. Yeah. So, yes, the older sister got the better room. <laughs> and this is Dylan's bedroom. Mm. Not much room for uh, <laughs> okay. two at a time. In fact, <laughs> Dylan said that my bedroom is so small, you have to go out to turn round. <laughs> and I think you can see what he meant. <laughs> It's almost as taller than it is wide. Absolutely. But it's remarkable to think how much, uh, well, creative writing and poetry came from this one room. It's phenomenal. And there are, this is room has been fairly accurately curated according to references that made by Dylan or his friends or his letters or, or whatever, um, including some of his literary heroes. And one of them, the main one, being W.H. Auden, mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. who was uh, an influence of sorts, even if Dylan spent a lot of his time criticising him, as you yep. know far better than me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the most important uh, poet of that era, the 40s and 30s. That, that's a photograph of him I've not seen before, of Auden. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I tried to find one that was of the era when Dylan would have been living in the house. Mm -hmm. where, and he left in 1937. So it needed to be before 1937. That's right, yeah. For that reason. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's fascinating, this room here. I think it's, it's wonderful. Was it originally, do you think, intended as a bedroom? It seems so small. Uh, or a major it's, room? It's what they wonderfully called a box room. You know, uh, <laughs> yes, as it, well, it's just a box, but yeah. uh, you, you, you'd often hear that, you know, four bedrooms and a box room. Okay. Um, well, this is three bedrooms and a box room, um, which ends up being four bedrooms. So whatever yeah. you needed a box room for. Yeah, absolutely. A young S poet. Some would, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's the parents' bedroom. Now, they did not sleep in the room where Dylan was born. That was kept as a guest room, mm -hmm. but it was deemed important enough an occasion, uh, birth of a, a new child, to use the guest room um, for that purpose and to yeah. honour that special <laughs> day. But this is where the parents uh, were slept. And now we, we often tease on the tours, Dylan talks of ugly, lovely town. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if he got that phrase from this room and maybe from the kind of spot where I'm standing now. Because if he'd have looked up that way, he'd have seen a lot of smog and smoke and heavy industry and the docks and the ships, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et and then he looks out that way and you've got the beautiful bay and uh, the mumbles and, 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 and the lovely part. So from this one spot where I'm now, he could have seen ugly and lovely Swansea. <laughs> we just drop that into the conversation. <laughs> We've spent enough time in the parlour. <laughs> this is the, the dad's study. Mm. Great room. Yes, of course, he would have... Uh, insisted on having a study as being the head of English in a, a, a grammar school because probably in the other houses this would have been a dining room. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, they missed out on the... And that's the dad there. And this is where he heard Shakespeare when he was four. I don't think he wrote himself, did he? He had this beautiful study where I'm sure he could prepare his lectures, but no writing from... Well, he, those... he, he was an aspiring poet yeah. who had to get to the point of realising that his boy was better than him. <laughs> that's, that's tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm not aware that, you know, he, he was a poet, but nothing majorly yeah. published. I mean, I mean, he was an academic at heart. Um, mm. He was denied the opportunity of being a lecturer, uh, because the universities of the time didn't want someone who was the son of a man who worked on the railway. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a definite class attitude that blocked uh, his progression as an academic, right. which is a shame. It's sad. Though we had a first. He had a first in English yeah. from Aberystwyth University. But that mm -hmm. rejection, those rejections, because there were more than one, is what drove him to want a place like this. Mm-hmm because he felt he could claim a place in society for himself that he had been denied. And he got there in the end. Well, I could see writing and reading in this study. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd feel quite at home in here. <laughs> Living room, which is where they did all their living because they didn't have a dining room, as I've just explained. The parlor that we've seen was out of bounds for the children. Uh, kept for best. <laughs> okay, I uh, first saw this house in 2003. And 2003 was the 50th anniversary of the death of Dylan. And the house at the time was leased by the local authority. They decided over the anniversary of Dylan's death that they would have the house open to the public. So they publicised that in a single paragraph in the local newspaper. I happened to be driving past and I called in out of curiosity. But I came away absolutely horrified at the condition of the house. It was like a bad student bedsit. Um, the kind of house that if you were looking for a student house and had 
10 to look at, this would be number 10 on your list. And if number 10 says no, and number 9 says no, you'd be starting to look for number 11. It was very run down, very poor condition. And a year later, the city council decided that they were not going to spend any more money on the most important house of, I think, the most important person to come out of Wales. And they gave the house up. I negotiated with the owner and took the house over in 2005 on St David's Day and decided that we'd try and take it back to its condition as a new house might have been in 1914. Um, we had very little to go on. We had Dylan's writings, his short stories, his letters, all gave little clues, um, but nothing particularly concrete. We found the sons of a man called Emlyn Davis, whose family had lived in the house for over 40 years. Uh, they were able to tell us the few things that his, their father had done to the house, which fortunately was very little. But the key to the whole restoration was that we found a maid, Emily. And Emily had worked here for five years when she was 15 and Dylan was 16. And so she was able to tell us all about the house, the colours, the furnishings, the house layout and the people. And that was our foundation and then all these other things slotted in on top. Uh, we stripped off the wallpaper, got back to the original wall colours. So all the colours that you see are original. The fireplaces are original, the doors, the skirtings, the ceilings. Um, so the foundation was there. Uh, we bought all the furniture locally. It came from car boot sales, came from charity shops, auctions. A friend's mother died at the age of 90, having lived in the same house all her life. So a lot of her furniture was what we were looking for. And we opened on what would have been Dylan's 94th birthday in 2008. His daughter, Ironwi, unveiled the plaque on the wall. And since then, we've done anything we can do to keep the house open. House tours, events, overnight stays, Edwardian dinner parties, uh, because we need that money to come into the house uh, as we've had no support from the council or the government in putting it back together. Would you like to say something about some of the events that we've planned for the future? Um, it's like um, Alan was talking about this, Thomas Hardy, um, sort of preparing um, yeah, to do a yeah. that sort of thing. Okay. Um, as we get back to normal, I suppose, after uh, COVID pandemic, um, we've uh, changed out the way that we operate in some respects. Uh, we've we've had fewer live events uh, based in the house. This is the parlour of the house. We have live events with poets, musicians. Uh, we can uh, pack in up to 25 people into this room. Um, but that, at the moment, is something that people are not too keen on doing. So we've done some Zoom events. Those have been very successful. Um, and I think we're looking further afield. We, we've got a conference coming up uh, next year uh, around the uh, anniversary of Dylan's birth, his 70th anniversary of his birth. Uh, sorry, it's not the 70th anniversary of his birth. 70th anniversary of his death is, is around that day. Um, so we, uh, we, up and coming next year, we, we around the 70th anniversary of uh, Dylan's death, uh, we've got a, a major conference that we're putting together with the Thomas Hardy Society. And that will uh, talk about uh, the way perhaps Dylan was influenced by Hardy. We know that his father's uh, favourite book was Jude the Obscure. And so we think that uh, there's lots of connections between Dylan and Hardy. And so that's a very exciting prospect for us because um, the Hardy Society is a, is a, is a major organisation. And I think then we will continue our, our live events. Um, 
we've got a couple of book launches coming up, uh, which will be interesting to, to see what response we get from those. Um, and settle back into poetry readings, musicians, because the house is a great place for not only established musicians, but young up and coming musicians and writers who want to establish themselves. And it's what a great place to have on your CV. I performed in the parlour of Dylan Thomas's birthplace. If, if someone is interested in making a donation to support the upkeep of the house, that's fairly easy. We accept everything, money, things in kind. Um, and the best way to contact us is through the website, which is dylanthomasbirthplace.com. Uh, there's contact details on that. And uh, we'd love to hear from people.